Welcome to Whole Life Insurance Mechanics from the perspective of Nelson Nash's infinite banking concept. I'm Ryan Griggs, and this is our introduction to our seven-part series. Let's get into it. What is this? <laughs> uh, in my time in the business, I have come to see, just recognize, that there is a certain structure, a certain set of information that needs to be covered with every new client who is who has you know Nelson used to say IBC is more caught than it is taught and if you read Nelson's book becoming your own banker or his other books uh, particularly building your warehouse of wealth you, you'll catch IBC or over time or with maybe more than one reading you'll catch IBC and want to do it and be motivated uh, and that's great that's where we start but to get from there to the particulars or how, more precisely how to think about the particulars of a policy for you, for your financial circum circumstances at a certain time and place, right? That, that part is typically what I would cover uh, with all of my new clients. So I would have a series of phone calls, uh, sometimes Zoom video calls, where we're covering a lot of that information. And just having done this, day in and day out for a long time, uh, it became it's become apparent to me that there's certain particular things that if people knew, it would help them understand how IBC is going to apply in their own life. And so this is about how to think about life insurance, how to think about specifically insurance built for the infinite banking concept for your own circumstances. Now, obviously, I don't know you, and I'm not going to get into like part, the particular advisory situation that everybody needs, but we're going to cover a lot of the ground that gets us up to that point, right? And like I said, this is this is what I cover with all my people. Uh, so, current clients, if you're watching this, welcome. Uh, you're going to hear a lot of stuff that you already know, and especially if you're one of my clients who likes to interact more frequently. Uh, you're going to know more of this. Uh, if you're new, you're not a current client, you're, you're going to hear an elaborated version of the kind of stuff that I would go through with people before we ever looked at an illustration, before we ever looked at an application, before you ever got a policy offer from an insurance company. Right? That, this course is that stuff. Right? When I say that this is my method, it, when I say method, it, it's the stuff I take my clients through. Uh, that's this course, but expanded deeply, right? <laughs> this course gets long. I think there's 98 slides or something. So it's a lot, right? It's a lot. Uh, and it is meant to be watched in order. There, like I said earlier, there's a, there's a structure to this information. There, there are certain things you have to know first in order to understand the implication of what comes later, right? For example, you, you're not going to understand why I feel the way I do about annually renewing term versus long dated level term writers. If you don't understand why cash value grows in a contract the way it does and why therefore PUA premium payment for a long time might be important, right? So the, the cash value growth mechanics have to come before modified endowment contracts and various term writers and whatnot. And you can already tell, I hope that this can get complicated uh, and that's why I want to make it available in a video format where you can watch it again and, and pause and there are slides. And so you, you can pause the show, pause the lecture and then read off the slide if you like. Uh, and, and I want this to be available to you in whatever setting is comfortable to you. So you don't have to hop on the phone with me. I mean, you can, <laughs> but you don't have to hop on the phone with me to get this stuff. I think this stuff should be just available. And I, I find my, frankly, a little confession time, I find myself sometimes getting frustrated that this information is not more widely available. And what I should, I should add the caveat that I don't expect you to agree or to disagree with what I'm going to tell you. You know, I certainly think you know, my way of thinking about this material leads me to certain conclusions. No question. And that's going to be obvious, right? But I, my hope is that 
you don't just take my word for it, right? These, sh these shouldn't just be assertions. There's plenty of that out there, right? What to think online. You can find all sorts of, and oftentimes the justification or the rationale for those assertions is lacking <laughs> to say the least, right? Could be better. Let's put it that way. Uh, I, I hope that you find that there's a more thoughtful commitment to the to, ex, to explaining the the how to explaining the why i don't just want you to take my word for it and if that means at, at the end of the day that you agree with my conclusions great if it means you disagree okay also fine i would just prefer that you have a, a solid articulated rationale for why you agree or disagree with me right that would be much better at the end of the day there's going to be people who are going to disagree there's no fixing that. Uh, it's not even something that needs to be fixed. But, it, it, you know, I, I, because a lot of this information just isn't out there, we, we're not even, as a, as a community, here we are in, you know, April 2022, I don't even think that we're in a position where we can come to certain conclusions one way or the other about these topics, right? So this is, in a sense, like a general education approach. This is... Uh, in a sense, what I think is a, sort of a, a prerequisite to coming to an informed conclusion or an informed position on certain aspects of the policy purchase process. Uh, they are intended to be watched in order. Uh, it is sequential, right? There's a structure to this information. Uh, as, as I mentioned, you got there are certain things you got to know first, so please do watch them in order. That's the way the course was written. If you're a client, you've heard me say this. Nelson used to say it all the time. If you know what's going on, you'll know what to do. My whole, you know, I, my whole process is built around this. I, I don't make sp specific recommendations to people. That's really not my primary focus. Of course, if someone asks my opinion, I'll tell them. Uh, my primary focus is to help people understand why things work the way they do in the industry and within a particular whole life contract. And if we understand that clearly, and if we understand the alternatives within a, you know, a certain scope within on a certain question, and if you understand that very clearly, you'll know what to do, right? You'll tell me a premium number. You'll tell me uh, how you're going to utilize that contract. And so, the, and like I said, this is built upon my method. So the, the course is really meant to illuminate what's going on and what the alternatives are at the various junctions, right? The various de decision points in the policy purchase process. And if you understand that, I believe that you'll know what to do. We wanna be clear to distinguish between what this is and what this isn't. Okay, this is not all of the infinite banking concept. Uh, there are people online who have managed to find the letters I, B, and C on a keyboard and they have access to the whole life insurance policy illustration software at a life insurance company. And they, you know, they have a position on structure and they, so they think a, a life insurance policy with a given structure is IBC. And no, that's not the case. IBC is what's in becoming your own banker. IBC is what's in building your warehouse of wealth. It's the human problem. It's, the, it's overcoming the arrival syndrome. It's overcoming Parkinson's law. It's understanding the importance of an intergenerational capital transfer process. It, it's, uh, it's understanding the banking function. It's understanding, to an extent, the fractional reserve banking process. Right? It's about being economically and historically informed, about having certain moral positions on things. So the infinite banking concept is so much more than just a, a structure of a whole life policy. Okay, and, you know, in a sense that I think I have it on a later slide, in a sense, the genie's out of the bottle. You know, it's like we don't want to belabor structure. So much time, in my opinion, is wasted online on structure. Uh, however, I think the reason for that is that there's not been a systematic treatment. There's not been a systematic treatment of first policy structure, so the various riders on a contract, nor premium structure. How much premium should go to base versus PUA? 
right? Which term writers we should, we should use. There's not been a systematic treatment of that. That's what this is meant to do. Okay, and that's what I try to take my clients through. We've certainly not been endorsed by anyone or by any life insurance company. Okay, I certainly didn't ask anybody's permission to do this. <laughs> I'm not really the type. Uh, so just, you know, we're not gonna mention company names. I'm not gonna mention agents or particular institutions. This is just general information. Uh, not endorsed by anybody in particular, uh, and nor is it investment, tax, or legal advice. Okay, I don't have any of the government permission slips for any of those things. Uh, you know, certainly before you do anything with your money, you should talk to somebody with the appropriate government permission slip, my terminology for license. Uh, you know, before you even get out of bed in the morning, just check with the, uh, the appropriate government licensed person. Right? So caveats, disclosures all over the place. Uh, and if, uh, this is definitely not a replacement for an individual consultation. Uh, you know, there is, like I said, this is general. This is the stuff I approach, I, I go through with, with everybody. I, I hope it's, in a sense, universally, universally applicable. But there are certain things about you, about your financial circumstances, the, the type of income you have, you know, whether it's set, expected, monthly, you know, as maybe you're a W-2 employee versus maybe you're, you, you have a cyclical or seasonal income or maybe you don't have income maybe you're just an investor right you sell well you could be an investor with cash flow but maybe you just buy and sell properties right everybody has a different financial profile certainly everybody has a different family situation and everybody has different long-term goals my hope is that this material is what you can with an advisor then apply to your particular circumstances. And the result would be a nice, clear, well-informed direction. Okay, I have a <laughs> have a pretty good experience with my clients. You know, we, we cover this material and the, the result virtually always is a confident, informed direction about the nature of, of how that policy is going to perform, about what the rights and obligations are for the, for the policy owner as it pertains to premium payment, uh, and, and an understanding of how that cash, what that cash value is going to look like down the road. Right? And that again, that's why I want this stuff to be available to everybody. <laughs> it's also why it's free, by the way. Um, all right, so that's what this is not. Okay, who am I? Who's been talking to you for the last 12 minutes? So I'm Ryan Griggs. <laughs> I'm trained as an economist, okay? And I don't have it on the page, but really this should say uh, Austrian economist. Uh, not a time and a place to explain what that means, but if you know, then you know. Uh, but I have a bachelor's and a master's in conventional economics. I did a year of a PhD program at Texas Tech in the 2016-17 academic year. Uh, Bob Murphy, a co-founder of the Nelson Nash Institute, a very prominent Austrian economist, very recognizable name, um, recent author of a book called Understanding Money Mechanics, which you should get. It's published by the Mises Institute, Mises.org. Um, there will be recommended readings at the very end of this lecture, but or at the very end of this lecture series. But anyway, Bob was a visiting assistant research professor at Texas Tech while I was there. Uh, and in fact, some of our interactions ultimately led to me doing what I'm doing today and taking the perspective I do. But uh, I, I was an intern at the Mises Institute in 2013, participated in their week-long summer program, uh, very intense, prominent, well-known program by now called Mises University. At the end of Mises University, there's a written exam. You can pass or fail the written exam. I passed it. People who pass the written exam can then do an oral examination in front of a panel of, at the time it was three judges, it may still well be. These three judges are prominent Austrian economists. Mine were Tom Woods, Tom DiLorenzo, and Jeff Herbener. Uh, and you can either pass, fail, or pass with honors for that oral examination. I passed it with honors. That was cool. Uh, and then the Austrian economic, I attended the Austrian Economics Research Conference. That's what AERC means. That was back in 2013. My goodness, it'll be 10 years next year. <laughs> Wow. Uh, I met Nelson in May of 2016 in Northern California when he was still doing his two day, 10 hour seminars, right? Two or three hours on a Friday, seven to eight hours the following Saturday. By the way, uh, 
Becoming Your Own Banker was the text for that seminar. The seminar predates the book, by the way. A lot of people don't know that. The, the book is essentially a, a compilation, of course, refined and edited, but a compilation of the teaching materials that Nelson used in that seminar. And the seminar itself, that two-day, 10-hour thing, that it wasn't always that form. Right? He tried all different kinds of forms, and he's explained on some podcasts uh, that I, you can still find online that it, it took him a while to figure out what the right structure for that seminar was. So he had to, there was a refining process and by the way, before that, he was a successful life insurance agent. So he was in the business doing well for a while and then started doing these seminars, refined the seminar into this one particular format. And then the materials in that refined seminar became becoming your own banker. Okay, so authorized IBC practitioners in the Nel with the Nelson Nash Institute, well, like me, will always say, if you want to do IBC, you got to start with becoming your own banker. That's why, okay, the guy who came up with it, that 92-page that book is the result of decades of engagement in the industry, refinement of the understanding of banking, and also expertise in Austrian economics. A lot of people don't know that Nelson Nash was personally mentored by Leonard Reed for 42 years. Leonard Reed was co-founder, along with Henry Hazlitt, of the Foundation for Economic Education, the probably the first free market oriented economic think tank in the country. Okay, so you know, there's the develop you could track the development of Austrian economics in the United States and and then map over it Nelson's experience in life insurance and they'd fit hand in glove. Okay. Uh, anyway, digression, but there's a, it's always a good day to talk about Nelson's background. Anyway, I met Nelson in 2016 and would later join the business in October of 2017 after my year in that PhD program. Another, time, another story for another time, I did not enjoy contemporary academia, particularly in economics. Um, I don't want to be hard on anybody, but yeah, I didn't love it. Uh, so decided, that, decided to get into the business. Uh, that realized some things about capital uh, that and this will be a subject of my dissertation that's forthcoming in a different PhD program, but uh, what I was coming to understand about the treatment of capital in the history of economic thought in the Austrian school in particular lined up really well, like surprise, like st astonishingly well with what Nelson was saying in Becoming Your Own Banker. And I'm like, oh, well, people need to know this. <laughs> so my point in all that is I'm not, obviously, as you can tell by all those little digressions, a conventional life insurance sales person or a financial advisor, financial salesperson. I've always kind of viewed finance like kind of a side eye, big fan of Barry Dyke, author of Pirates of Manhattan. You know, there's a, the amount of corruption in uh, finance is just stunning. And so the idea, the idea that I would ever be involved in that just kind of makes you feel dirty. <laughs> uh, if you would have told me five years ago, well, maybe six years ago now that I'd be doing you know, life insurance sales for a living, I would have thought you were insane. Uh, and back then it was not 2021, 20, 22. So not everybody was insane. <laughs> uh, but my point is that I come at this from a, a position of an educator. You know, my mom's a still to this day, a elementary school teacher. And I wanted to be a professor for a long time. So that's why this whole thing is organized as a lecture series. That's why I take the approach I do with my clients. I spoke at the uh, annual Nelson Nash Institute Think Tank, which is our annual conference in 2019 and 2020. 2019 was the last conference uh, that Nelson uh, attended. He passed away in March uh, of that year. And then I spoke again in 2020. I've been the co-host of a podcast called Banking with Life. Many of you will have seen that or heard it. Uh, if you've not, go check it out. Right? It's hosted on my business partner and mentor, James Nethery, James Nethery's channel. Uh, I'll put his name here. Uh, last name Nethery, like Weathery, but with an N. All right, James Nethery. Uh, we co-host that podcast. He will talk to clients on the podcast. He'll do Q&As on his own. But maybe 40 to 50% of those episodes are me co-hosting with him. So we'll talk about IBC-related issues for, you know, 45 minutes, 
90 minutes, a long time. And as of the rec as of this recording, it's been just over three years that we've been doing that. Uh, ever since I've been in the business, I've only done IVC. Okay? I have an exclusive IVC practice. Uh, there, there are many advisors who will do other stuff. They'll sell auto insurance or property insurance. They'll manage money and fine. I, I'll stay silent on all that, but I've only done IBC. And that's for, as far as I can tell, going to be the way it stays. <laughs> uh, and so when I say I've you know been in this business for almost five years, come October of this year, 2022, it, it's been almost five years of just doing IBC. And so the material you're going to hear in this lecture series comes with that background in mind. I told you that I'd be very upfront with where I'm coming from on all of this stuff. Uh, and I, I believe that our philosophy should come first. So this is my sort of philosophical view of life insurance policy design for the infinite banking concept. It is to establish a personal monetary system that allows you to pay as much premium as you can reasonably foresee wanting the ability to pay for as long as possible in order to build as much cash value as possible, all while maintaining the non-MEC status and flexibility in premium payment. I know it's a word for, uh, a mouthful. I get it, but it's that way on purpose. Okay, there there are certain things that, as we'll see, you know, for instance, uh, the the idea of, of wanting to pay as much premium. Uh, as you can reasonably foresee wanting to say for as long as possible. Okay, that, that's a big part. It, this idea that well, I might like to pay a premium into this policy in 25 years. And well, well, might I need certain things in place to be able to do that? And I talk in terms of the ability to pay. Another word, a good word for here instead of ability could be the authority to pay. Right? Do I have the right to pay, for instance, a PUA premium? in 20 or 25 or 30 years into my policy. I might like that. If I if that's something I might like, well, are there certain structural components that are necessary in order to preserve that right? And what does that mean for the, the other the rest of the contract? Right? So the, as I as you're going to see more and more as we progress, this philosophical approach has implications for the way you buy insurance today right and like nelson said think long range this is a it's a very long term oriented view and it is becoming your own banker it's about becoming it's about putting yourself in the position of control right nelson said how much of the banking function do you control as it pertains to your needs so all you know, if, if we want to maximize control, I want to maximize control over how much premium I can pay and when I can pay it and for how long I can pay it. Okay, well, that it could be, and it is, by the way, that there are certain features of a contract uh, th that we would that we want to evaluate to make sure that we can do that. And of course, to build as much cash value as possible. This is all about capital accumulation. It's all about cash value generation. We want to retain that non-MEC status and flexibility in premium payment. You know, one thing that we're going to learn about a lot later is that the the PUA rider, the ability to pay PUA premium into these policies, varies quite dramatically company to company. Okay, put differently, the terms and conditions governing PUA premium payments varies significantly company to company. Okay, we have a I have a conversation with clients about company selection. You know, what goes into that? Nelson said other things, you know, that the dividend should go to the to go should go to PUA to contribute to ongoing compounding. Well, there's stuff out there these days that says the dividend should go somewhere else. Right? So there while this philosophy might seem sort of generalized or or overly overly verbose, I want to sort of compact it into one statement that, you know, certain components of which we can refer back to as we proceed through the series. And so here's our overview. We've kind of done a little brief introduction. This, this lecture was short. Uh, the next one <laughs> will be longer. 
Uh, we're going to talk about policy infrastructure next. This is uh, the, the five essential components of a contract, right? Base premium, uh, the initial death benefit, let's say PUA premium, dividends, and of course, cash value. And so we'll talk about how all of those things uh, interact together. That'll lead us to a discussion of modified endowment contracts, right? These are what we call MEX, MEC, and then we'll get into term writers. Once that's covered, we can talk about policy loans. Right? Got to understand what cash value is and why it grows the way it does before we can talk about policy loans. Uh, turns out a policy loan is just one of what are called non-forfeiture options or NFOs. So we'll talk about non-forfeiture options. That This is a phrase that's like never spoken. <laughs> online and there are options that policy owners have a right to and you should know what they are uh, direct versus non-direct recognition right well i abbreviate them it will abbreviate them dr versus ndr i have a position on this i think one is better than the other period i'll tell you which one and why uh, this case studies let, I know you see case that everybody's example hungry. I get it. By the way, there's great examples in becoming your own banker. Right? Every part of the book has an example. So if you are craving examples, it's okay to go back to becoming your own banker. Now we're going to, in this sixth lecture here on with case studies, we're going to look at actual examples from an actual client, actually more than one client, of what can go wrong in the policy purchase process, in my opinion, and how it could have been done better. And we're gonna utilize the information in lectures two through five. Okay, so in, in six, we'll use concrete examples to apply what we've learned about how things can go wrong and how they should have been better. And then we'll wrap up with a conclusion. Now, I. Again, I know that, uh, again, example, hungry. P again, please watch this in order. <laughs> You're not going to understand some of the things that I say in the case studies section if you haven't watched the prior uh, lecture series. Um, and here's next time. At the end of every one of these series, at, at, at the end of every one of these lectures in the series, I will tell you what we're going to talk about next time. And... That's policy infrastructure, base, PUA, dividends, and cash value. You know, I have my agents. They need to be able to tell me uh, on the spot, no preparation, what are the four things that cause cash value to rise? Uh, so we'll talk about that, and then we'll get into what that means, some of the initial implications uh, for policy purchasing at the present time. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you then.